Welcome, welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Friday. Man, we made it to the weekend. I'm excited about today's show. I'm excited about the weekend. I'm excited about uh, Warren Sapp and the Korean Cosell, Steve Kim joining me on this show. And I'm excited because, as I've been t- telling you guys all week, this first cup, this first cup coffee has got me fired up. It's got my mind sharp, and I think it's improving this show. Uh, Today's episode is brought to you by First Cup Coffee, a Christian-owned Patriot Coffee Company that stands for core values, family, and building community across the nation. First Cup's freshly roasted beans delivered in ground or whole bean texture, pods, and bulk. Go to firstcup.com and use the promo code FEARLESS and save an additional 10% on your order. If you subscribe, you can save another additional 10% for the life of your subscription. First cup, I, I, I've been completely honest with you guys. I have not, over the course of my life, been a huge coffee drinker. These people at First Cup, they got me on board. I love the taste. I love the way it makes me feel. I love the way it sharpens my mind. Uh, they're creating a little habit with me. I'm not, you know, I'm trying to stick to a, you know, half a cup, a cup a day. But I love to drink it while I'm doing this show. Helps me improve my content. Uh, so anyway, join me. First cup. Uh, I want to get to uh, this fire starter. Let's get this party started. But I, I do want to tell you guys, listening over Apple, in particular, if you're listening to Apple, I need a small thing for you to do. Hit that five star rating. I'm telling you, we got spam with one star reviews. They dropped our rating down to a 4.8. We need it back at a 4.9. Hit that five-star rating. It's a little bit of effort to help improve this show and to help improve the, uh, the spread of this show. If you're watching over YouTube, make sure you hit the likes button. Make sure you hit subscribe. Make sure you hit notifications. Thank you for joining me. Now I'm going to reward you with a terrific uh, fire starter. Then we'll bring in Steve, Cam, Steve Kemp and fan these flames. Uh, the two most important players in the National Football League, uh, they don't play quarterback. They play wide receiver, Miami's Tyreek Hill and Philadelphia's A.J. Brown. Most NFL experts have yet to reach this obvious conclusion. They've so far failed to fully recognize the consequence of the rule changes initiated to make the game safer and promote scoring. Football is no longer a heavyweight combat sport. It's a battle of lightweights, a competition controlled and decided more often than not, on the referee's scorecards rather than knockout punches. An imposition of will has been transformed into a game of finesse so that it is more palatable to women, emasculated men, and non-sports fans. Wide receivers dominate today's game, and their importance to the game will only grow more stronger as the league continues to reduce the degree of difficulty and risk for all players. With eight games to play, Hill and Brown both have a chance to eclipse 2,000 receiving yards for a season. The NFL record is 1,964 yards, a number Calvin Johnson reached during the 16-game 2012 season. The NFL now plays 17 games. According to gambling odds makers, though, nothing has really changed in the National Football League. Five quarterbacks, Patrick Mahomes, Jalen Hurts, Lamar Jackson, Tua Tungvaloa, and Joe Burrow are the favorites to win the league MVP. The odds are a reflection of the mindset of Associated Press voters. They've been programmed to follow the prescribed NFL narrative. The quarterback of the most successful team is always a front runner for MVP. Quarterback is the most difficult and important position in all of sports. That's the old mindset. This is no longer true. No position in sports has had its degree of difficulty reduced as drastically as quarterback. They no longer call their own plays. They run simplified college style offenses. There are restrictive rules and regulations limiting when, where, and how you can hit a quarterback. The consequences for throwing a receiver into coverage have been virtually eliminated. Patrick Mahomes doesn't face the kind of challenges Johnny Unitas, Bart Starr, Roger Stallback, 
Terry Bradshaw and Dan Fouts confronted throughout their entire careers. Patrick Mahomes. Mahomes isn't playing in the same game that Tom Brady and Peyton Manning played when they first entered the NFL. Football has changed. The way we evaluate value and importance needs to change too. In the nearly 70 years the Associated Press has been naming an NFL MVP, no wide receiver has ever won the award. In 1987, Jerry Rice probably should have won MVP. He scored 22 touchdowns in a strike-shortened season. He played just 12 regular season games. John Elway won the MVP award in a very close race that year. Quarterbacks and running backs have dominated the MVP. Defensive tackle Alan Page, kicker Mark Mosley, and linebacker Lawrence Taylor are the only three players to win the award who did not play running back or quarterback. This year, we should strongly consider adding a new position to the MVP club. In the new, kinder, gentler NFL, <clears throat> wide receivers are just as important as quarterbacks. Tyreek Hill and A.J. Brown are, allow are allowing two solid former Alabama quarterbacks, Hurts and Tung Viola, to masquerade as MVP candidates. Strip Hill and Brown from Miami and Philadelphia, respectfully, and Jalen Brown, or Jalen Hurts and Tua Tung Viola, they're nowhere near the top of the MVP race. I'm not denigrating Hurts and Tua. They're solid players. I'm recognizing the greatness of Hill and Brown and the transformation of football. The whole receiver position has never been more important than it is today. Rule changes have elevated the importance of the players who line up outside the hashes. Football, when it was a game defined by physicality, used to prioritize the players who lined up in the middle of the field. You would build an offense around the center, quarterback, and running back. You would build a defense around a defensive tackle, middle linebacker, and safety. Now, the most valuable players are on the outside. Receivers, edge rushers, and corners are ascending in value. The MVP vote should reflect this new reality. It will be interesting to see if the NFL allows its media partners to discuss the new reality. The league's television ratings are tied to selling the myth of the all-important, all-American quarterback. Will diva wide receivers attract as wide an audience as Mahomes versus Burrow, Manning versus Brady? What's going to happen when Minnesota's Justin Jefferson realizes he's more valuable than Kirk Cousins, but he makes half the money? What will that contract negotiation look like? Teams, management, and head coaches have been partnering with quarterbacks for decades. The New England dynasty hinged on the relationship among Robert Kraft, Bill Belichick, and Tom Brady. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, Vikings head coach Dennis Green partnered with Chris Carter and Randy Moss. As Carter and Moss's influence grew within the Minnesota locker room, the culture soured. The Vikings fired Green in 2001 after he started the season, I think, 5 and 10. A league built around wide receivers is going to be quite different from the one that used to rely on quarterbacks and running backs. My prediction is it's going to be a lot safer, far less predictable, and a lot more appealing to the crowd that loves Desperate Housewives and The Bachelor. That's my fire starter. I can't wait to talk to Steve Kim about this. Before I do, guys, I want to tell you, talk to you about <laughs> one of our biggest passions here on Fearless, Preborn. Why is our society so ravenous to abort babies? According to a former Satanist, the demonic forces have a bloodthirst for the innocent and sickly. Believe their blood sacrifice empowers evil. Make no mistake, we are fighting a spiritual battle as we protect the most innocent among us, babies in their mother's womb. Preborn stands on the front lines of this battle, and their network of clinics are positioned in the highest abortion areas, often next to abortion mills where unspeakable evil takes place every day. Preborn offers God's love and life to protect hurting women and precious preborn babies. And every time a baby is saved, which happens 200 times a day, good conquers evil. 
please make your most generous gift to empower good and rescue precious souls. For just $28, you can sponsor an ultrasound that doubles a baby's chance at life. To donate securely, dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250, keyword baby, or do it the Jason Whitlock way. Go to preborn.com slash fearless. That's preborn.com slash fearless. All right, uh, let's roll out to uh, Los Angeles and bring in the Korean Cosell. Uh, Cosell, I'm going to start you with a softball. What do you think of my take that uh, Tyreek Hill and A.J. Brown should be leading contenders for MVP? You know, it's interesting. I was actually on with Coach J.B. and Darnell a few hours ago when we were discussing who's the MVP. We kind of drew a blank because the natural assumption now is that is a quarterback driven league and it is a quarterback driven award and quite frankly this year the quarterback play has been really been mediocre it really has been and I said what about Tyree Kill if he gets 2,000 yards the question is if the Dolphins do not become a dominant team let's say they don't win 12 to 13 games they sneak in there as a wild card I'm not so sure that any number one receiver short of having a Jerry Rice in 1987 type of season, will be number one. But what you see is a trickle-up effect. This is part of that seven-on-seven -seven culture where that seems to dominate young high school football players' lives. There's a lack of hitting. Physicality is not quite the same. But, Jason, I, I will push back on this, though. When it comes to Jefferson in Minnesota, yeah, you can make an argument. At his position, he's much more elite and is elite compared to the guy that just got injured in Kirk Cousins. Let's see what his production looks like moving forward with Josh Dobbs. Now, that was a great story last week where Dobbs didn't know anyone's name, pulled out a victory. But I'm just telling you, the quarterbacks still matter, though. Because if you look at those other two guys that we mentioned, they still have pretty good quarterback play at their disposal. Steve, I agree with you. I'm not saying Tua and Hurts aren't good. They're, they're rock solid. They're, they're good, but they're not great. And to, to see, and, and Patrick Mahomes is not having a great season. Uh, Lamar Jackson's putting up nice numbers, and, and to me, he's probably the real leader in the MVP race based on voting patterns and history, but, but the game of football has changed. I think we all agree with that. And, and one, you know, when I was writing and thinking of this mono, I was thinking of you because of your coverage of boxing and just how boxing is clearly the premier combat sport, but, but football had been somewhat of a combat sport, an imposition of will. And as a former offensive lineman and someone who's watched the game, I'm looking at the value of players now start to extend out on the edges. And, and that's a dramatic change in football. And so while Hertz and, 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 uh, Hertz and Tour are good, the greatness on their teams is actually on the outside with the wide receivers Let's snap out of tradition and recognize that, that the receivers are better than the quarterbacks on those teams. And, Sam, and, and Philadelphia has a chance to have the best record in football. Why not give it to A.J. Brown? Why wouldn't he be a leader or a, a really a top five contender for the MVP? He's outplaying all of these quarterbacks. You know, I, I don't disagree, but again, let me just go back to this. You're right. I agree with you. Tua and Hurts are really good, maybe not great, but I, I do think they're a cut or two above Dobbs. And, and to, let's monitor Jefferson in the next few weeks. So Okay, so we got that. But you're right. But the MVP the last 15, 20 years, if not longer, it's kind of like now the Heisman Trophy in college football. It's not about the best player. It's about who has the best quarterback play or numbers on an elite team. Because I, I've said this, and I think you agree. In my view, the best pure football player the last dozen or so years has been Aaron Donald. Best pure football player, right? At his position, dominating, impacting a game, being disruptive. And he has all the accolades. He makes all the all-pro teams. He's going to be in a Hall of Fame. Never snipped an MVP. 
you know, and, and that that's the reality of it, that the MVP is basically, all right, who's the best quarterback on the best team that has a Super Bowl run? Going back to a couple of those seasons, I remember in 1986, Lawrence Taylor that year was by far the best player. I mean, the things he did outside on that all-time great giant team. But I do remember what happened to the quarterbacks that year. Dan Marino, the Dolphins struggled. They didn't make the playoffs. Joe Montana, if you remember that season, Jason, he had a broken back back, basically. And he missed about seven, eight weeks. So a lot of your big-name quarterbacks didn't really have great statistical seasons back then. And then Jerry Rice in 87, Jason, in 12 games, he had over 20 touchdowns. That, that's amazing. I remember watching that particular season, which was his third in the National Football League. And as someone that hated the Niners growing up as a diehard Ram fan, I said, oh, boy, we're going to have to deal with this guy for the next 10 years. And you got the sense he was an all-time great. But, Jason, think about it. If Rice couldn't win the MVP ever, in his career, and I, I've i always thought he makes an argument for being the greatest player ever, okay? And, and a lot of people say Jim Brown. I wouldn't argue. But the NFL Network about seven, eight years ago did a top 100 all-time. Number one was that guy from Mississippi Valley State. So think about it. If he can't ever win an MVP unless the thinking has changed from the media, and they're very dogmatic in their thought process. Um, short of one of these guys getting 2,000 yards and being part of an elite team, it's still an uphill climb. I, I got it. So I, I'm not, I don't want to have an argument about what the voters are going to do. The voters are going to screw up and get it wrong. Jerry Rice had 22 TDs in 12 games, and, and my favorite player of all time, and the guy I really believe authentically is the greatest quarterback of all time, got the MVP when probably didn't deserve it, John Elway. Uh, but, Steve, this isn't about what the voters are going to do. This is about doing the right thing. And so, to me, it's like a discussion in 2000 about, where, hey, could a black guy be president? And they proved in 2008, yes, <laughs> yes, he can. And no one, oh, it'll never happen. It can't do blah, 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 blah. People's thinking changed. And there were people that were obviously people in the Democrat Party was like, yeah, no, a black guy can't be president and we're going to run one. And and we did. And it happened. I, I think me, you, others, JB, people that follow the game very closely, we need to take the time to explain to the media and everybody else like football has changed and we have to evaluate these wide receivers and their impact on this new flag football version of football that these guys can win MVPs. The NFL used to be about running backs. And from Bronco to Jerski to Jim Thorpe, and Jim Brown won the first two AP MVP awards. He did it before, you know, he won those before Johnny Unitas won his. Running backs used to dominate the NFL. Quarterbacks now dominate the NFL. I think we're moving into an era where it's gonna be crystal clear wide receivers are dominating the NFL. Let's change who we're voting for. There might be a ray of hope in that. Let's go back to the COVID season of 2020. Who won the Heisman Trophy? Devontae Smith, a pure wide receiver. And I believe before him, the only other pure split end slash flanker that ever won it was Tim Brown in 87. And a lot of that had to do with two punt returns on a primetime game against Michigan State. Now I'm actually hearing that Marvin Harrison Jr. is in the Heisman Trophy race, which again says to me, hmm, that's interesting, given the fact I actually think he was better in other years, uh, specifically last year when he had C.J. Stroud. But Jason, we can also make an argument, maybe the receivers are just a recipient of rule changes that make the game easier and that quarterbacks are still the heartbeat of any team. I mean, couldn't we make that argument? And that, yeah, okay, they're they're they're. You could, you'd on. be wrong, but uh, well, no. okay, but <laughs> you could. Making, I'm not gonna say you're wrong. I'm not gonna say you're wrong, but, but, but you let's could, but I would slightly disagree. These are not necessarily unprecedented numbers in a sense that this isn't Babe Ruth uh, out homering the rest of the league. I remember in the mid '90s 
a receiver that is vastly underrated by the name of Herman Moore. Remember him? Big, tall guy at a UVA. He had like three, four years in a row of 100 catches, and I think he had over 1,500 yards. Michael Irvin had a streak of about 8, 9, 10 games of 100 yards. Sterling Sharp should be in the Hall of Fame. He was putting up massive numbers in the early to mid-90s before his career was unfortunately ended prematurely. So, yes, these numbers are great. The 2,000-yard mark has never been broached, okay, or breached. But let's, let's not make it sound like this is something that we've never really seen before. I'm not arguing that they're put I, – I, I, I don't think that Tyreek Hill or A.J. Brown are better than Randy Moss. They're not better than Jerry Rice. They're not better than Calvin Johnson, who owns the single-season record at 1,964 yards in 16 games. I don't think I don't think Hill and Brown are on their level. I think the game has changed so much that even okay. at a diminished level, that they're they're like you know Brian Sipe won the MVP playing quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. He's not an all-time great quarterback, but he right. won the MVP. Yeah, and so that's all I'm well, yeah. and Mark I, Griffin, I, that's what I'm saying about these receivers. But Jason, let me tell you this. That's what I'm saying about these receivers. And I'm not wishing this upon anybody, but let's say Tua gets sacked again and doesn't land correctly. Let's say he lands again on his head. He's out four weeks. And let's say Jalen Hurts on the brotherly shove finally gets his back broken and he's out for a month. Um, ask any Eagles or Dolphins fan, okay. If you had a choice, who would you rather have out, one of your receivers or your lead quarterback? Because I would surmise that if you took Tyree Kill and A.J. Brown away from their team, there would be a loss of effectiveness and explosion and production, no doubt. But you could still scheme up other ways to get the pass game going. But again, could you do it with your backup quarterback? Would that offense be the same? You almost baited me into a bad reply because I was, I, I was going to say that who would you rather have, who would you rather lose, Joe Montana or Jerry Rice, and then I was like, well, hold on. Steve Young's the backup. <laughs> Nothing there would no change. Steve Young's <laughs> yeah. There are, there that, are that, no but, Steve Young's anymore, okay? That's the reality. You know, look, look, you I, look I, I, they were a lot better. Let last me give year. let me give you one. Let me give you one. Let me give you one. T take take Denny Green's Minnesota Vikings when they had Chris Carter and Randy Moss. It didn't matter whether it was Dante Culpepper, Randall Cunningham, or Jeff George playing quarterback. They put up numbers with those receivers. Yes. Put up numbers. And it's three guys. From Randall Cunningham was in the MVP race one year, uh, and then uh, he got he loses his job the next year, and Jeff George has one of his best seasons, and then the year after that, Dante Culpepper comes in as a kid and puts up big numbers. If you have the right receivers and the right head coach, the receivers can make any quarterback oh. look up. Look, Brock Purdy looks damn good playing for Kyle Shanahan. I, the the way the, the way they've made this game so easy, I do think you can plug in some guys with the white the right wide receiver. Every quarterback that plays for Andy Reid looks amazing. Every one of them. Maybe he hasn't had a bad one yet. Well, Jason, let's take a look at that that Viking trio you talked about. Jeff George, when you want to talk about arm talent, his picture should be in that you dictionary. Tell me. He was the number yeah. one pick in the draft, okay? The only one that could stop Jeff George was Jeff George. Randall Cunningham was good enough to at least, you know what? People forget, he won an MVP, I believe, in 1990. And the other guy you talked about, Dante Culpepper, had a big arm and I believe was a top 10 pick. So it's not like they were getting just anybody. Those guys still had some very special skill sets, all three. Those guys were special. And don't forget Jake Reed. Jake Reed. Was Randall Cunningham was the thirty seventh. Was the thirty seventh pick of the uh, second round. Thirty seventh pick overall in that nineteen eighty five draft. That that's pretty highly drafted. It so is. I, 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 he was, 
But and again, people, the guy, he was 35 years old, and people thought he was done. And he, yeah, he finished second in the MVP race at age 35 in 1998, playing with that trio of of monsters they had in Minnesota. Yeah, and don't forget Robert. I think Smith Jake Reed was on that team. And, yeah. Uh, one one final thing about Randall Cunningham, people forget All American punter at UNLV, so don't forget that. So this was an all time. I, look, Randall Cunningham, I've said for a while, he was two generations ahead of his time. In today's offenses, where you allow and you kind of believe that mobility is not just a luxury, but it's almost a necessity, he would be again the ultimate weapon. Okay, but so let's just let's be honest. As great as that trio was outside you got to have some guys that could deliver the ball consistently and he, they had that so Cosell what do you think about my contention then that, we, that, that the value of outside players receivers corners edge rushers is escalating and that's antithetical to what used to be valued the middle of the field in the NFL, and, and that this league moving forward is going to be more and more about diva wide receivers. And I'm not sure if it's going to, will it have the same appeal as a league that was dominated by all American quarterbacks and running backs? I, I look, I actually agree with you on that. Whether that means that wide receivers are MVPs or not, that's another question. And Jason, we are now into the late fall or mid fall. Weather's going to get a lot colder. The game gets a little bit more difficult when the leaves turn. It's snowing. It's sleeting. The, 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 the temperature drops. The AstroTurf gets a little harder. The ball's more slick. So let's see what happens. We're still only about halfway through the year. But, Jason, let's take draw this parallel. If you look at NBA basketball today compared to when we grew up and we were really fans, it's a different game, right? Everything is about the three-point shot, the perimeter, uh, you don't have traditional fives. Nobody really plays back to the basket consistently. And guess what you see in the AAU? That stuff right there. Whether you hate it or love it, that's that's up to you to decide. Now, you look at football. What dominates the offseason in high school football? It's the seven-on-seven -seven circuit. You know, and it creates certain patterns and also creates habits. You know, I asked uh, Coach JB one time. I said, Coach, why is it that certain quarterbacks now, or more than ever, don't understand that you have an internal clock of about two to two and a half seconds. You got to get rid of it. And I see guys taking blitzes on face side rushes, which should never happen. If you could see the rusher, that's up to you to get rid of it. And he said, oh, it's easy. Because when you grow up on seven on seven with no pass rush, you start to think you have five, six seconds and you can just pump and hitch all day long. So what is happening at that high school level in my view, along with how now the game is legislated and officiated, yeah, there's no argument. There's going to be more of an emphasis on players at the perimeter. Steve, I, I want to switch topics. Before I do, I want to take care of a little business, uh, tell you guys my little cheat code to uh, uh, my improved health, health or my improved uh, weight loss and just getting in better shape. You know, I got my resting heart rate down uh, to around 65. Uh, I was I checked that out the other day. I've been really exercising hard. One of the reasons I've been able to do it, you guys know, is because I've been taking Nugenics. Are you tired of wasting your money on testosterone booster products that don't work? I don't blame you. That's why our sponsor, Nugenics Total T, lets you try before you buy. Get a complimentary sample when you text 231-231 and enter the keyword fearless. Are you really, really ready to lose your shape, your muscle, your energy? As men age, we lose our testosterone, the man hormone, the source of our fire. But Nugenics Total T boosts free and total testosterone levels to help you feel better at work, in the gym, and in the bedroom. There's nothing like Nugenics Total T and nothing better. Nugenics is the number one doctor recommended brand and the number one selling testosterone boosting brand at GNC and Walmart. Eugenics Total Tea can help re-energize your life and help you get back the powerful, confident, good-looking warrior you used to be. And if you're not totally satisfied, Nugenics will refund 100% of your purchase price, plus shipping and processing. 
Now get a complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total Tea when you text 231231 and enter the keyword FEARLESS. Text now and get a bottle of Nugenics Thermo X, our newest, most powerful fat incinerator ever with key ingredients to help you lose fast and get lean fast absolutely free. All you got to do, text 231231, enter the keyword FEARLESS. You're going to get a free sample. You get to try before you buy. Tell you, the stuff has helped with me. I'm working out twice a day now. I really am. And I'm, you know, as I told you guys earlier this week, I went back to eating once a day and it's been great. I've been feeling better, feeling sharper, and my exercises uh, have taken off. Like I said at the beginning of this, I got my resting heart rate down to about 66. Can't believe that. Uh, the stuff I'm doing on my Stairmaster, I can't believe. Anyway, Nugenics, hop on board with me. All right, so back to the Korean Cosell, and, and you guys go back to hitting that five-star uh, rating on Apple and hitting the likes. Uh, but uh, Cosell, I want to play you something, or I want to talk about something. Dan Levitard is questioning the legitimacy of Aaron Rodgers' Achilles injury. Obviously, this is somewhat COVID related, uh, but but Dan has been calling out Aaron Rodgers and now wants to debate him about his Achilles injury and probably debate him about COVID. Let's let's watch a clip of Dan challenging Aaron Rodgers. Sports Illustrated is reporting it through awful announcing through the aggregation of things. He said the take as if it wasn't his take. I was jealous of the take when he had it. Why? Yeah, so was I. I am here to say right now, publicly. Well, Dan, I, congrats. The internet has made it your take. Yeah. Okay, well, then I'm going to double down on what isn't my take. Double down? Aaron really? Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers. I think your doctors are fake. Debate me. Hmm. I want to debate you on I believe your doctors are giving misinformation about how injured you actually were. <laughs> And I believe this is all a storyline plot meant for you as the coach of the Jets pleads the fifth when asked about Zach Wilson. So we're Trevor Simeon. <laughs> anyway, what do you think of him challenging uh, Aaron Rodgers here? Well, based on what I know about Aaron Rodgers' deal with uh, Pat McAfee, how much of a check are you willing to write? Um, this is what I love about Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> He doesn't give a damn about Levitard, but if you pay him enough, he'll probably give you 20 minutes of his time. This seems desperate by Levitard. I guess he wanted his viral moment. I don't know if he got it or not, but if he has anything to say about his recovery, he'll go with old Pat McAfee, who's paid him for his services. And I, I don't know, uh, maybe Aaron Rodgers, when it comes to his doctor, how about this, Dan? Maybe he's just trusting the science. How about that? Um, I, I don't understand this. So you're saying this is an elaborate ruse that everyone's in on, or at least Rodgers is. And so let's get this strategy straight. The Jets and the Rodgers are rope-a-doping the whole league, like Ollie against Foreman, by saying, hey, guys, let's overinflate or fake an injury or something, and let's just take the first 10 weeks so I can look like a hero. Is that, is that what he's saying, or is he just saying that this whole notion that Rodgers is actually on his way to recovery is fake, but – um, that looks desperate that a guy like Levitard or anybody says, I want Aaron Rodgers to debate me. You know what the problem is? Based on what you said, old Danny boy, um, Aaron Rodgers wouldn't give you a second or a minute of his valuable time. That's the reality here. I'm going to go a little bit different. I, obviously, I think this is leftover from the COVID deal. And it's like, hey, Aaron Rodgers misled us about taking the clot shot or, or the vaccine. Uh, and so now we can question anything about his medical history because right. he didn't tell us the whole truth about uh, the experimental medical trial that doesn't stop COVID. And so, but, but the other thing I find fascinating is it, it goes down a lane of just raising all, well, how is he recovering so quickly? And, and I'm just wondering if there's one standard for Aaron Rodgers that many people in corporate media and in the regime media or left-wing media, they don't like Aaron Rodgers. So you can say things about Aaron Rodgers 
you can't say about others because the other inference here is like, hey, what are you doing to get back on the field so quick? And if someone were to do a show saying, man, LeBron James, hmm, uh, wow, how are you playing so well at such an old age? This kind of reminds me of Barry Bonds. What are you doing to hmm. perform at this level to keep that by? And if someone did that, if anyone raised any questions about LeBron's health and how's he doing it, but they would all get shouted down as racist and uh, hate haters and blah blah blah. And so you can't, you know, talking in publicly about someone's health issue and wanting to debate them about their health issues. It's okay to do to Aaron Rodgers, but we know if we did it to some of the other athletes that are far more protected, you, you would be flagged for unsportsmanlike conduct and your whole character would be questioned. That, that's, you know, that's kind of my take. Yeah, with Aaron Rodgers, it's funny. Uh, there's no talk of his body, his choice. I find that very ironic how that <laughs> applies in certain cases. To certain people, but not to him. Now, look, look obviously, Levertard wants to draw this in. And all Rodgers has to do is basically whatever clip that's on. I don't know if he follows him on Twitter. I get the sense that he doesn't follow Levertard. Uh, I, I would just take a page out of a former president and I'd see like, nah, you're fake news. And then let it go. And then go right back to McAfee and give everything Pat McAfee wants. Because that is a loyal guy who's been by his side the whole time. Being dead seriously, like, why in the world would I ever try, if I'm Aaron Rodgers, why would you ever try to help or even placate that guy in any way? It makes no sense. And it, it seems, you know, here's the thing, Dan. Why don't you just have enough guts to say, this is what I think about Aaron Rodgers' situation. This is what I think is happening. And go with it. That's it. Put out your position. Because guess what? Aaron Rodgers does not want to debate you. I get the sense he does not even care about what you have to say. Thank you, Steve. Great job as always. Uh, enjoy your weekend. Enjoy your college football weekend. Man, I just thought we haven't talked about Dion all week. I may have to sneak that in uh, to a question about Warren Sapp. Or maybe I'll just stay on my Dion fast for the entire week. Warren Sapp, next. It's my obligation on hate discrimination raising up your hands for freedom. Jason Whitlock, previously on Fearless. I know some politicians and, and have had close relationships with some high-profile politicians. But in my heart of hearts, I don't like politicians. And so it, it's no different than when you hear me talk about, I don't like elites, even though people would consider me an elite, even though I've had some elite friends. I don't really like Ivy League educated people. I've had some Ivy League friends. I, I, I don't, but in my nature, I just don't like politics and politicians. I get they're a necessary evil, but it's not my jam. It's just not. And so my, what I'm passionate about is sports and culture and the Bible and America, patriotism. That's what I'm passionate about. For years, Hollywood has been lacking when it comes to stories of redemption. Movies and TV shows have trended towards the anti-hero, the flawed person who makes no effort to change and just becomes worse and worse as the story goes on. Well, here's some great news. The Blind, the true story of the Robertson family, is now available for purchase on Blaze TV. Maybe you've made a mess of your life. Maybe someone you love is in a dark place. Maybe all of the above. If you or someone you know feels beyond redemption, you need to watch this movie. You'll see there is always hope, always. The Blind takes you on an incredible journey through the life of Phil Robertson, giving you an intimate look into the man behind the legend and the trials and the triumphs and the values that have shaped him through the years. While The Blind wasn't a Blaze Media production, since Phil is such a big part of our Blaze TV family, we wanted to make sure you had the opportunity to stream it right here because it isn't ours. 
we can't include it as part of the subscription. But if you'd rather purchase it and stream it here rather than Apple and Amazon, we wanted to make sure the opportunity was there. Act now. Don't miss this opportunity to own The Blind, a Phil Robertson story on Blaze TV. Buy it today at blazetv.com slash the blind for $19.99. That's blazetv.com slash the blind. All right, welcome back. Uh, time for one of the greatest segments on this show, if not the greatest segment on this show. I, Steve Kim will probably disagree with that statement, but uh, I love our segments with Warren Sapp. No one's talking better about the National Football League and football in general than Warren Sapp. Uh, Warren, we've spent uh, the better part of this afternoon talking about the rise of wide receivers and my contention that Tyreek Hill and A.J. Brown actually should be the leading candidates for MVP. There's never been a wide receiver win the MVP, the Associated Press version of the MVP. And I think the game has changed so dramatically over the last 20 years that now it kind of caters to the wide receiver and it's time for one of these guys to win the MVP. Do you agree? I think you're on the, I think you're on the right path right there because – when you look at these two men and they're averaging over 109 yards a game, <laughs> that's like the old running back. When we talked about a running back gaining 100 yards, you'd win the game 38 out of 40 times or something crazy like that. That's what's happening right now. They are affecting the game that much. And I, I like the path you're on because we've never seen it. You know, Jerry Rice had, what, 23 touchdowns in one season. He didn't win it. Randy Moss had 25 in one season. He didn't win it. Hey, man, I, I I think it's about time. But these two are something special because A.J. Brown is just a physically, jeez, I, I, I've never seen anything like it. And Tariq Hill, you know, carried that Florida boy fast with him. So I love that. You know, when you can have you can strike fear in the heart of a defense, it's like Randy Moss matched into two guys. You know what I'm saying? With that speed. and But A.J. Brown don't go up and yoke it like old Moss, but – they, 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 they have the effect on the game like that. And when you're talking about six, eight touchdowns, you know, both of them over 1,000 yards right now, I like it because the quarterback situation, what we got, we, they're not giving it to Tua. And then Kirk Cousins is out of the game, and Josh, the headless horseman, showed up again. I mean, it's just it, – it's like it's like it's a bad – it's like a like, – like a, like a bad dream that it just keeps reoccurring for him some Sundays. I, I just don't get it. And then Sam Howe is number two in passing yards. So, yeah, let's give it to one of the receivers. It, it, it'll be cute. It'll be cute. It'll be the first time we've done it. And these, t these young men have the numbers for it. Well, it, it's – it may be, particularly in the case of Jerry Rice, it may be long overdue. Jerry Rice had oh. 22 TDs Come in on. 12 games, Warren. I, I, it, was, I, it was the strike shortened season. Trust he had 22 me, I, I, TDs ridiculous. in 12 games. Ridiculous. And, I mean, they, 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 did, they, did, they did silly things back then. They, 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 that, that, those were the real Superman because, hey, you had to catch it with your hand. They didn't get to brush the ball up. It was nothing to help you. It was just raw football, just raw. <laughs> and And – Megatron, I think, has the record for the most receiving yards no. in a season, 1,964. Mm -hmm. That was an incredible season in 2012. But, it, you know, he wasn't on a great team. A.J. Brown is on a team that's a legitimate Super Bowl contender, uh, has one of the best records in football, if not the best record in football. Uh, Tyreek Hill is helping the Dolphins uh, become a serious playoff threat. It, it, it's... I don't think Tyreek Hill and uh, A.J. Brown are better than Randy Moss or Jerry Rice or even Megatron, but I do think where the league has gone, it's, it's, a, do it's a league dominated by wide receivers, and they've what we have to acknowledge without being haters, just being <laughs> factual, is the degree of difficulty for playing the quarterback position We've never seen it reduced this way for no, any position in it's any easy. sport. It's yep. much easier, and we need to mm -hmm. acknowledge that. Oh, no, it is. And 
it's easier for the receivers that we have to run the routes they run and get open because when I run four, three, eight, and you run four, three, two, and you have a free release, I can't turn and run with you. It's just physically impossible. I mean, it's just too much ground to cover. I was looking at the the Bucks and Texans game, and C.J. Stroud went to do the little run pass option and popped up to throw a slant. I said, wait a minute, let me rewind this. <laughs> because somebody got to get a – it's just too much room. With. He that, the receiver doesn't even take a step forward. He just goes down the line and just takes off running. That You can't defend this. This is just a wide-open game, and those receivers there are the two of the scariest I've seen since Randy Moss showed up in 1998 in the NFC Central. Yes. Scary. Let me ask you a long-term question that we may not get the results of for 10 years. Ooh. But as the league leans more into the wide receivers being the dominant players, do you think it will sell as well as the league that was sold by quarterbacks and running backs previously? Do you think that will have the kind of mass appeal? No, they're going to they gonna still sell as a quarterback league. I guarantee you this. They're going to they gonna, they gonna find some way. We, we can talk to this A.J. Brown and Tua thing in the middle of the year because it's cute and it's getting around, you know, after Halloween, getting around Thanksgiving. It's a fat guy holiday. You know, we get full. We get a little foolish. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. They go, one of these quarterbacks going to take off in the next couple of weeks, throw up a bunch of numbers. I mean, Josh Allen right now, if if the headless horseman just stopped showing up, I mean, he's 71% completion with 18 touchdowns and 2,400-plus yards. I mean, that – that that right there should be enough to win you an MVP. But for some reason, he just wants to throw the ball to the other team and not do the things that he practiced all week long for some reason. I mean, what a talent. What an absolute talent. And Patrick Mahomes is having an off year. I mean, in, in Tua, everybody's waiting on the next little, little bump in the mall with him walking his kids down the highway to drop him out of the thing because, trust me, I know the heartbeat of Miami Dade County. It, they're not behind Tua. They just they, they don't believe him for some reason. It, it's crazy. It is crazy. Well, I, they probably want a guy with a stronger arm, and and Tyree he, he Hill might he have fifteen hundred. He cannot throw Tyree <laughs> Hill. He cannot throw Tyree Hill. Uh uh-uh. uh. You got you got to get to that position where you launch that ball. That man. That man's dumping. Tua's playing exactly the way he should in that offense. You got to get it out of your hand, put it in the playmaker's hand, allow them to do it. The problem they're going to have is when the playoffs come, the frill shrinks. And it doesn't get as deep. And your quarterback got to make good throws and little throws. And then you got to turn to a Marshall Falk and say, hey, we're we going to hand it to you the next eight times. Can you get this done for us? And we're going to see what Monster got. We're going to see what their backfield looks like because that's what it's going to come down to. It's late, cold in the year. People tired. We got tired to be blocking and waiting on this little cute route. And then the little cute guy in the cold don't run as cute in the cold. <laughs> hey, man, it turns into a big me, guy league. Can you block and run? Can you tackle? Let me go to you talked about Josh Allen and his talent. And Buffalo is very interesting. And you started out the year talking about the headless horseman. I started out the year talking about the problems he has with Stefan Diggs. And here we are now. Five and four, and look at the rest <laughs> of their schedule. Broncos, Jets, Eagles, Chiefs, Cowboys, Chargers, Patriots, and then Dolphins. Hey, man. Are, are, are I see there one cake in there. That's Belichick and Crumpany. Yeah. That's the only, only thing I see yeah, in that's there it. is New Year's Eve. That's it. That's it. Everything else, you're going to have to play. And whew, Can you I, see them missing the playoffs? Yeah, I can see them getting indigestion from a Thanksgiving meal in the 26th to 10th. <laughs> that, that's, that's some tough sled right there, buddy. Holy smokes. Mm. I like it, though, because anything worth getting is worth earning, and that's the schedule right there that earns it. And that'll earn you an MVP if you go out and perform in that right there. Because Tony Dungy always told me, November and December is what they remember. <laughs> okay. If they don't get it done, what do oh. you do if you're Buffalo? Who who takes the blame? More than likely, Sean McDermott, the head coach, Absolutely. has to take the blame. They're the GM not for not giving Josh him a, a running back. The GM for not giving him a running back in the backfield. 
asking the quarterback to run, and then in the middle of the year, everybody in Buffalo like, stop running. There's no one else to run. He got rid of his running back. So somebody's got to run it. I mean, they, they, NFL defenses are going to adjust. They're going to get – they're going to adapt. They're going to make you do the things you don't want to do. And that's run the ball now because your quarterback is hot. We're going to drop eight. We're going to make you run it. So, Stephon Diggs has put a spotlight, though, on Josh (laughs) Allen. And Stephon Diggs may throw up his arm and say, I want out of here in Buffalo. You know, this thing in Buffalo seems really volatile with a – Very difficult finishing schedule, particularly with the way it started out with Diggs and Josh Allen. And so Josh Allen will remain in Buffalo, but he may remain there without his number one wide receiver or his wide receiver doing everything in his ability to get out of Buffalo and point the finger at Josh Allen. Well, we did say that the wide receiver has become the most important part of the most important player in the NFL. <laughs> hey, without one, a great quarterback is going to be running around that thing like Brady. Hopefully you got two tight ends and somebody that know how to draw it up ugly and crazy. But we saw this hand right on the wall early in the year. I told you the young man plays with a reckless abandonment. And here's a receiver that wants to be utilized in a game that's wide open. The middle of the field is wide open. Stephon Diggs ain't got to worry about nobody clocking him up, thinking about knocking him out or putting him, you know, out in this certain situation when he come across that middle. He knows it. And he wants to be utilized in that fashion. I'm a Lamborghini. It ain't nothing but an Autobahn in front of me. Please give it to me. That's why – that's all you hear from Jamal Chase. I'm always open. All of them are 7-Eleven. All of them are Circle Ks. All of them are Wawas. <laughs> they all over 24 hours because they are. There's no way to put hands on them and, and to neutralize them other than to putting two people on them. And then it's going to take a disciplined quarterback to see the two coverage and then go somewhere else. But they're not. They're going to throw it in the coverage. <laughs> they're going to throw it. So you just got to pick them off. But, hey, when there's a when that's that much smoke, there's definitely fire at the bottom. And when you're five and four, there's a lot of microscopes that get put on a locker room. So everything that's said right now in Buffalo, be careful, fellas. Be careful. It's a long season. (laughs) Hey, guys, I want to talk to you about a new sports apparel brand that has partnered with us, Unitas. The sports and lifestyle apparel industry has been dominated for years by companies with woke agendas, companies that use your dollars to push the woke mindset of woke athletes. Unitas is the alternative. It's a new clothing company founded by NBA player Jonathan Isaac that offers a value-based alternative for stylish, high-quality sports and lifestyle apparel. But it's more than a cool clothing line. Unitas is a growing community and movement, bringing people together in support of traditional values like faith, family, and freedom. When you shop Unitas, you're you're building an alternative economy that is necessary for the future of our country. Later this month, Jonathan is launching his first signature sneaker, under Unitas called the Judah One. You heard me talk about it on Wednesday's show. This will be the first ever signature shoe to feature a Bible verse on the exterior, inspiring you to live out your faith with boldness. Let's all commit to supporting Unitas with our dollars. To shop Unitas and sign up for exclusive access to the Judah One, visit weareunitas.com. That's we are U-N-I-T-U-S. Make sure to use the code BLAZE1 for free shipping at checkout. That's weareunitas.com and the promo code BLAZE1 for free shipping. So I want to move on. J.J. Watt said something very Mm -hmm. interesting this week. Uh, I think there's been more than $3 million in fines (laughs) level. Yeah, $3.2 million in fines leveled against NFL players. Three fines. And basically, they're getting fined for playing football, Warren. Things that if they had done them in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, they'd celebrate it for. Now they're getting fined. J.J. Watt tweeted out, I will say it again. This is stealing money from guys. These absurd fines for routine football plays have got to stop. Fines for intentionally or willfully intentfully, malicious hit plays, absolutely, taking $21,000 from 
from a guy for this, and he shows the Patrick Richard hit. What, what are we doing? This is out of control. Then he tweeted again, and don't tell me it's about player safety. Cut blocks are legal. You can literally target a player's knee without your with your helmet intentionally. So don't act like we're on some uh-huh. high and mighty player safety crusade. Th- this fine against Richard is ridiculous. This is an ISO block. This is how you draw it up. This no. Is, there's not a coach. Wait, 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 wait. You got a problem not with the, that? Not, not, no, 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 not the fullback. The fullback. The fullback, five? yes. See, that's yes. the problem, Evan. See, that was, I see, you know, people got, you know, I, 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 I almost said it when it was uh, Demar Hamlin. We're talking about the tackler. What? What? That's the fullback. What else is he supposed to do on the ice on the goal line? I heard that a couple weeks ago from the lady uh, headlines judgment that said the illegal use of helmet by number 26 for San Francisco. And I was like, what is that? Like, what what are we doing? Like, like what are we emphasizing? And I want the powers to be to do this one favor for the old big guy. And I'll shut the hell up forever in a day. I, I won't say anything for a whole year if y'all do this. Show me a video where you demonstrate you leading with your shoulder and your head not being there. I just want to see. I just want you to demonstrate. Hit a moving target with your shoulder and eliminate your head. I, I just want to see it. Please, just show it to us, and then we'll do it. We'll go do it. But I want you to demonstrate this. Hit a moving target with your shoulder, and your head ain't in front of your shoulder. It's impossible. <laughs> and, it's and impossible. It's no way. Do you, there's not a film room, football film room in the country oh. where that block that Ricard just put on wouldn't be getting played over and over and over again. Or and the, the coach or said, the guys, hit, this is how we by, do it. Or the hit by uh, uh, Shallow Sanders in the, in the game in there. That, that's textbook. Yeah. That is textbook. And I'm just sorry. Everybody consider, oh, 21000 bucks. Oh. You know, they're rich NFL. I'm, I'm sorry. Whether you're making, I think Ricard makes uh, $2.75 million. But whether you're making $2.75 million or $27 million a year, $21,000 is a nice piece for of playing change. football. It's a nice piece that's of a cr- That's a crime. That's, that's a, a nice cr- piece of change. You can, hey, hey, you know how much fun. I used to, you know how much fun you can have with $21,000? Hey, like I said, that's a nice piece of change. You get your lady a nice, <laughs> nice watch, nice necklace, jewelry. You, you could dress her out. You, you'd be set for the next 15 years at your house with $20,000 you're spending on your old lady. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I know exactly what you said, my brother. Yes. You, you, you get a lot of furloughs out of that. <laughs> <laughs> they crazy, man. Yes. Hey, listen, they, they hit the boy. For the hit um, in Pittsburgh against the Bucks in the preseason for like forty three, I called Brooks. I said, "Brooks, you got to do something about this." That I, I just, that I, it reminds me of you when they used to have that back come out and you used to go smack him. I said, "It's nothing but a Derrick Brooks special." He did exactly what he was supposed to do on the play, read it, got to him, put the hit on him, and now they gonna find this man almost fifty thousand dollars. You only get a thousand in preseason. That's why we used to go crazy about preseason games. I'm like, I'm not going in because if I get a fine, that's coming out of my real money. And uh, uh-uh. no, 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 we're not doing that. But I will tell you this. <laughs> I will tell you this. Rondé Barber, my Hall of Fame, you know, number three six, number three six three in the Hall of Fame, used to set aside a half a million dollars for his socks fine every year. Yes, yes, he's wearing high reds, high blacks, all whites. Yes, every week. It's a fine. I used to look at him and be like, you just crazy. I mean, how much turkey or possum or, you know, coon or whatever meat or protein you like, you take it off your table. It just doesn't make sense to me. I Only fines I'm getting for is the ones I get for playing this game, and then I'm going to fight like hell to get some of it back. But it used to be like five grand for the first hit, 7500 for the second. You know, the largest fine I ever got at Cess was like 25000 when I allegedly was supposed to bump the referee and – Washington, but that's that's another time for another story. And a uh, big cigars and some. Hold on, sink, oh, hold, hold on, hold on. You, you, you gotta you gotta go back to Rondé Barber. Oh yeah, I think of the Barber brothers. 
Yes. As very as smart, very wise individuals. Raised. Yes, highly intelligent yeah. young man t- raised by a single mom, $30,000 a year. How did she do it? And he would set aside a half a million dollars for his uniform fines. Yes. You know what they once said. They should have never gave you no money. <laughs> 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 now, you're making me circle back to where I didn't want to go, but you th- want to- and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna circle back to our conversation last Friday, where Uh-oh. I'm just like, if if athletes can set a, set aside a half million for fines, how come you couldn't set aside a half million to start a business in your oh, hometown oh, community? Oh, oh, get back to your school. I, I I get it, but I, you know, I got one. You know, charity I set up when I was in the National Football League was the Warren Sapp Municipal Fund, and I didn't let much go out that door. Absolutely not, because I had some people at home I needed to take care of. So a fine for a uniform, socks, no. Socks, jocks, pants, jersey. That's it. I Nothing else. That's all I had. You, whatever it was, number 85 on the wall, Tony Dunn used to say it all the time. Can you please look like number 85 on the wall for me, please, gentlemen? And Rondé and them boys would set aside their fire money. I'm telling you, I, it was crazy. I'm like, boy, y'all boys crazy. Yeah. He's not hurting financially, though. He's good. Yeah. I know. I, I know. He, he, th- <laughs> those guys are smart. They but Look, I consider myself relatively smart. And if I started telling stories about the Oh, money no, 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 no. Me and I'd you are two smart guys. And we sold away a lot of money yeah. after 1130 at night. <laughs> <laughs> where you at? There's neon lights outside of the outside of Yes. Yes. <laughs> but I like my like so. my good defense environment partner in Oakland, Tommy Keller, used to say, we all have our devices. Not vices. <laughs> devices. <laughs> <laughs> so I left it at that. I huh. you know what? That's cool, right? Yes, we all have our devices. Yeah. Not vices. Devices. <laughs> 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 uh, <clears throat> we'll end on this note, Warren. Uh, did you see the uh, Lambo weep from Caleb Williams? Uh, he jumped into the stands, the USC quarterback, uh, after losing to Washington. He jumped into the stands to cry in his mama's arms. I'm calling it the Lambo weep. Uh, your thoughts as a defensive tackle, as a QB killer, uh, can your quarterback – leap into the stands and cry in his mother's arms and still uh, maintain, hold your respect? Ooh. You know, it's three things on my football team you don't bother, but that one we're going to have to have a discussion about, young man, because there's some things that we're just not going to project, perceive, or have perceived about our football team. Is that we'll let, you know, first of all, you know, the light skinned brothers are a different breed. You know, they just, they just different. I'm just going to say this out loud. And anybody that knows me, been on my team, you know what I say about you, cranberry suckers. Y'all just a little different, you know, just a little tartness to you. You know what I'm saying? I don't know why, but it just, it just don't taste the same. You know what I'm saying? And, and now we see. But this is a young man that paints his fingernails in Utah and then go out in Utah, whoops him. So, hey, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe it was just time to cry. It was a lot of, you know, built up frustration from the Notre Dame interceptions and and then that Pettit boy was over there working. Them boys, them boys that you dug was working, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I've been on that uh, that opposite end when they're working you at home like that and it, it's going bad, but I don't think they was at home. I think they, yeah, they was. And then it was 56 in the first half. I thought about it as a bet, man. I said, what the hell was the over-under in this game? <laughs> 105? Because, boy, they, boy that, that's... I thought he played. I thought, hey, I thought he put forth a great effort. But you know, running, jumping your mama's arm, and then it, what was the towel about? Like nobody knew what was happening underneath the towel or something. I, that I mean, was a, a card or card, poster whatever. board or something I mean, like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I don't. Is that is that mom's I'm or not a big fan? No mom or is that mom's? I mean, ah, jeez. You can't even explain that, man. You just just hope the young man and learn from you know the lessons of the game and come back next week and you know he has his Heisman Trophy. That's they're not gonna take that from him unless they bought his mama. Well, you can buy your mama a house now, so he ain't gotta worry about that. She, hey, well, what we crying about? Then you say you weren't going to the NFL unless they give you the team you want. What you crying about, man? I mean, you you remember Matthew Stafford had the interviews and they asked Matthew Stafford about his mom and dad, you know, divorce. 
And they said that almost cost him his number one pick. So he went off like, don't ask me about that. And, you know, had a real fit about it. So, you know, asking a man about crying in the stands and his mama, you think he'll break down again? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Warren, thank you. you. I do love you. you Enjoy your weekend. (laughs) I'm going to F1. Enjoy your weekend. Be good, baby. All right. (laughs) Take care. That's Warren Sapp. Uh, guys, I know that many of you are uh, still bitter about uh, <laughs> last week's show, but I'm so sorry. I love Warren Sapp. I love talking football with Warren Sapp. Uh, we're going to continue to work on him and his worldview. It'll get better. He'll be around us. He'll be influenced by us. It'll get better. All right, we're going to play some tomorrow, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. I just want, I wanna be, I just